Now on nurses, breastfeeding's not as easy as it looks. It's major surgery for Roy Hardy, and Helen copes with chronic arthritis and a baby boy. The results produced by the special camera Roy swallowed revealed the location of a large polyp in his small intestine, so today he's going to have it removed. Consultant gastroenterologist Steve Hughes explains how the polyp was discovered. We've just gone through from the stomach into the duodenum cap and uh, it's about to go around the bend into the small bowel proper and we're now beginning to see the villi, uh, these little finger-like projections. Uh, in the small bowel which allows you to absorb food and we're now going down the small bowel proper. Moving on to the area of the polyp there's quite a, a big abnormality here. Uh, you can see that this is the normal small bowel and on the left hand side there's this uh, rather swollen area with, with a rather white surface to it. The capsule is trying to to squeeze past it. You can see this area of the mucosa's pressed right against the capsule, as is this bit here. And uh, the capsule just can't get through this slit-like lumen uh, between the, the polyp on the left and the normal lining on the, the right. This is quite a big polyp. The benefits for Roy of this cutting-edge diagnostic technique are immense, as it means his surgeon, consultant Barry Pentlow, will be able to go straight to the spot where the polyp is located with minimal surgical disruption. Scrubbed and ready, the surgeon first makes an incision so that he can go through the peritoneum to gain access to the intestines. But there's a small hitch as the team go deeper. Consultant anaesthetist Edward Walsh asks Barry Pentlow to pause as there is a marked change to Roy's vital signs which are closely monitored throughout the procedure. We'll have to handle it, put it back inside. Just leave us to When the surgeon um, pulled on the bowel, it caused a reflex slowing of the heart. So we just asked the surgeon to stop that for a moment, and then we've given him something to speed the heart up. So it's just speeding to go up now. OK, Barry, that's fine. Um, I'll put back some Rachel Hillen is a midwife and she recently took up a specialist post as breastfeeding coordinator in the maternity department. She spends a great deal of time teaching new and expectant mums the practicalities and benefits of breastfeeding. She regularly runs workshops at the hospital together with her midwife colleagues. For the mother there are many advantages for breastfeeding and recently they have um, done some work on um, breastfeeding and the reduced risk of premenopausal breast cancer. Some of the other benefits of breastfeeding for the mother include a reduced risk of postpartum hemorrhage. When the baby goes to the breast following delivery, oxytocin is released to help the milk flow. And also oxytocin actually works on the uterus, which can reduce the amount of bleeding that the mother may have once she's delivered. For the baby, there are many more advantages because of the antibodies in the breast milk. The babies are at reduced risk of um, infections. There's also the reduced risk of asthma and eczema, reduced risk of diabetes in later life. One first-time mum is Rachel Ashpole, who was taught by Rachel Hillen, and she now feeds three-week-old Benjamin herself, although it wasn't easy for her to begin with. I would say I was going to give up. I was sat in hospital expressing, and I was only getting a drop, you know, a li little drop, and I was thinking, I can't feed him on that, so I did go onto the bottle for two days. And then um, I saw that the breastfeeding consultant, Rachel, she taught me how to basically get Ben to, to latch on and how to get him to take the milk. Um, but he has to be really latched on, otherwise they don't get enough milk. They just get sort of the full milk or they'll just suck it and they don't actually get anything out of it. So she showed me how to do that and how that I have to keep feeding regularly to make the milk. You know, everybody says that the breast milks are good because it gives them the best start in life, really. And so I wanted to and I wanted to get the closeness that you get, that you get with it. And you definitely do. I think it's lovely. It is a closeness, especially on the night feeds. But he's just in a lot of pain at the moment with his colic. So. Some mums really do want to breastfeed and you do have to be really committed because it does take up a lot of your time and it is a new skill that you have to learn. 
I think it is definitely something that you think is just going to happen. If it doesn't, you do. You know, you do have to work it. Definitely. And it's too easy to give up. You think, oh, I'll just give up because I can't. I'll get a bottle, it's easy. But it's not. It is worth it. Once you can get going, it's definitely worth it. Eighteen-year-old Helen Jones has suffered from juvenile arthritis for 11 years now and has to have regular hospital checkups to monitor the progress of her condition. She and her mum had no idea that this disease was present in Helen at all. I woke up one morning with pins and needles from my head to my toes everywhere and went to the doctors and had to have loads of tests done. But I was, woke up one day with pins and needles and then the next day or the day after you told you got arthritis and it's like, it's a bit much to take in all at once. <laughs> just thought it was all for older people, like my grand's got it and things, and it was like, didn't think that you could get it when you were young. It was just not possible. <laughs> the worst thing about having the arthritis was going through school, getting picked on, and just growing up with it and watching your hands go from a normal looking hand to hands with lumps and stuff on it, and like my jaw. I've got photos of me when I was younger with a chin. I haven't got one now. Although my friends say you can't notice it, but that's because of my friends. But other people in the school, they used to make sure that I knew that they, they could see it. They couldn't notice my hands because I always walked around with fists. My fists were clenched all the time. But I spent a lot of time in a wheelchair. And if it wasn't for my mum, I'd still be in it now. If I couldn't get out of bed in the morning, she'd help me get out of bed. And as soon as I was on my feet, that's it, you do what you need to do. It's all been down to my mum. Just don't let it get to you and stuff. It's hard, very hard. This has been tough for Helen and also for her mum, Paula. I can't let her feel sorry for herself. It's an awful thing to have and anybody would feel sorry for themselves to have it, but I couldn't allow her to do that. You know, it's to be quite strong, you have to, come on, get up, do it. You know, If you don't, you, you'll just end up staying there. So I was very tough, to be quite honest. <laughs> if it got her out of the wheelchair, it was worth it, wasn't it? I, I don't think you un really take in what it means to have arthritis. Uh, she was first ill at the end of April, and by July she was in a wheelchair, which is a, a shock. I was never really explained what she would go through. You know, arthritis is the, the joints. As far as I was concerned, it was pain of the joints swelling but not disfigurement you know helen's got disfigurements on most joints now and how awful was it going to get that that was the main concern how awful was it going to be the worst times for me are in the mornings i hate the mornings i dread getting up in the mornings because it takes me so long to get going but once i'm going i'm i'm fine you wake up and you're stiff and you can't bend your arms and you've got a whack them into place and stuff. It's, it's hard to explain what you've got to force them to bend and stuff. But once you're going, you're you're right for the rest of the day then, normally. Back in Main Theatre, Barry Pentlow's finally reached the location of Roy's polyp. As predicted in the camera pictures, which said the polyp was probably about a foot uh, from the end of the small intestine. There's the end of the small intestine, but the polyp is here, the bowel wall looks slightly indented, and if I squeeze it, you can sort of see a thickening there. He has, in addition, got a, an abnormality that he was born with, a, a so-called Meckel's diverticulum, which is a, a little cul-de-sac which comes off the intestine like that. Occasionally, they can become inflamed and sometimes mimic the appearance of appendicitis. Because it can sometimes give trouble, um, I'm going to take that off, and I'll, I'll do that before dealing with the, the polyp down here. It's called a Meckel's diverticulum. It's derived from a Greek word meaning a house of ill repute. Um, <laughs> it is. You make it. Yeah. <laughs> with the cul de sac removed, Barry Pentlow moves on to deal with the main part of this procedure removing Roy's polyp. This is the polyp just here. I'm going to remove a, a couple of inches of intestine and part of the so called mesentery, the, the tissue that supplies the intestine with blood. The digestive system can function quite well, even if a certain amount of bowel is removed. It depends whether you've got an intact large intestine as well. 
um, if you have a, a smaller segment, then you may get food may pass through more quickly, so you may get diarrhea. You may also sort of fail to absorb some sort of essential elements. But you can lose several feet without any problem at all. Just about to cut the barrel on either side, and we'll join it back together again. You can see that in spite of having those soft clamps on, there's some blood coming from the ends of the bowel. That's a good sign because to heal properly it needs to have a good blood supply. That's all looking quite satisfactory. At home, Rachel's hoping that Ben will breastfeed successfully, which he usually does at this time of the day. But she has some doubts as Ben has a touch of colic. I think we can get you to do what you should do. Because of your stomach, I can't guarantee it. We'll give it a go. Come here, you. Breastfeeding doesn't come naturally. And if the baby is very distressed, um, it may be because it's so hungry that it just wants to feed immediately and it's just getting cross because the milk's not there straight away. Um, and it may be because the baby has actually got some tummy pains, a bit of wind. There must be a lot of pain in. So for the mother, the best thing she could do, firstly, is to try and calm her baby down. Because if the, if the baby's really distressed, mum will automatically become distressed and this can interfere with her milk letdown. This was so frustrating because they want it and they just won't, they won't take it. Come on. If a mother wants to breastfeed and it's not working out for whatever reason, she shouldn't feel guilty because she has done her best. Maybe try some skin-to-skin -skin contact. Actually take the baby's clothes off and leave the nappy on and place the baby in the upright position on the mum's chest and just have the calming stroking effects and massaging the baby just to calm them both down. It goes quite a knack to getting it, to getting them to do it. Um, and that once you've got it, it is generally OK. But um, he's got to want to do it as well, which is the problem. And today... He doesn't want to. Some mothers will find um, that actually walking around with their baby is an easier thing to do than actually skin-to-skin -skin contact. And I think m most mothers will instinctively pick their babies up and walk around with them to try and calm them, just change babies' positions. And if they are windy, that may be the opportunity then for the baby to actually release the wind when he's out. <laughs> At the emergency department, Gavin's dealing with young Charlie Parker, whose schoolboy dare has gone all wrong. Right in, mate. That's all right. What I've got down here is you have an eraser stuck in your ear. Well, what's actually happened? David said uh, I need to put your rubber in your ear, so I put it in. I went to get it out, and it went in forever. Never fails. Which ear have you put it in? That one. That one there. Okay, just a bright light. Nothing worse than that, and then we'll have a look and see what we can see. And you like pink erasers, then, do you? <laughs> He's my second one this morning. Uh, I've had a kid with a bit of chewing gum up his nose that he'd stuffed there, and uh, mind you, he was about three years old, but in general, they're always doing it. Okay? Well, right. Hurt. Gran! This is your chance to come in on the action here. OK, if you could just sort of stand on the other side of the uh, trolley there. What I want you to do is hold that light and shine it into his ear. Sorry, mate. Ow. Sorry. Oh, it hurts so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's looks worse than it is. Oh, God, he felt like something was pulling my ear. <laughs> well, I'll teach you not to put one in your ear anymore. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Arthritis sufferer Helen Jones never thought she'd see the day when she could be playing with her own baby. For Helen, the joys of pregnancy were twofold. When I found out I was pregnant, I, um had to stop my medication because of complications and things. But I didn't need it. I was fine. There was no, no, not even a little niggle. There was no pain whatsoever. Not even 
a finger or anything. It was brilliant. I wish I could be like it all the time, but not get the fat part of it. But <laughs> wish I could have that, whatever it does, your hormones and stuff. It's just, there was no nothing, no pain at all. There isn't many people that have, you know, teenagers that have been pregnant with arthritis, but I had heard that it would be in remission for the pregnancy and then hit after. Uh, I was worried that she came off her tablets because she's never come off of them before without a bad reaction. Although overjoyed at her pregnancy, the strong medication she has to take could have had major implications for the health of her baby. I was told, not when I first got my arthritis, but a couple of years into it, that I may not be able to have children. And when you're told that and you find out you're pregnant, you don't want to have an abortion. You want to keep that baby, whether there's something wrong with it or not. Well, nothing's 100% with a pregnancy, but if they were sure that the baby was not disabled, it might have been her only chance to have a baby. Um, so she took it. Luckily, it worked out fine, but might not have done. Helen's arthritis meant that a natural delivery was out of the question, so Keenan was delivered by caesarean section. I was so happy when they said that I had a perfect baby boy. I was over the moon. I was expecting them to say, look, he's got such and such wrong or he's got a test for this and stuff, but there was nothing wrong. But Helen's hopes that her arthritis had gone were soon to be dashed. I did think my arthritis had gone, but then once I had Keenan, it came back, the arthritis came back with a vengeance. It affected everything. I went from walking one day and I couldn't move the next day. It was so bad, it was just a one whole ache. It was really, really, really sore. It's hard dressing him because of the, the poppers and the buttons and the little bits that you've got to do and stuff. Nappies are quite hard if the, the tabs are stuck together too hard. Same with baby wipes when you're pulling the seal back, that's hard. Um, unscrewing bottles, everything, but you've got to find your own way of dealing with things. Like shopping and stuff is so hard to do, especially when you're holding a baby, trying to carry shopping and your arms aren't as strong as they should be anyway. But it's just something you've got to cope with. My mum's there, so she does a lot of things for me. She helps me a lot. She's got a lovely baby now and she copes with them brilliantly. But the future for Helen is going to be even more challenging. I've got two operations coming up. One is to basically break my jaw and reset it right. And the other is to break my hand and reset it straight. <laughs> so to the one on my jaw, there is no jawbone from up there to about there. There is no jawbone on either side. And they've got to replace it and straighten it. It's crushing my airway which means I've got to have the operation done. There's no ifs or buts about it. I hope she gets what she wants because she wants a chin. <laughs> That's her main thing. She's always wanted a chin. Roy Hardy's operation to remove the polyp from his small intestine is almost over, and now he's about to be given a bit of a bonus. Now, I told him that as he's got an incision which looks like an appendix incision, it might be sensible to take his appendix out at the same time. I'll only take it if it's relatively straightforward. A long appendix. A very long appendix. Normally the appendix is about half that length. Not about that. Must be about eight inches long. With his appendix removed, Roy is carefully sewn back up and will gradually be awakened from the anaesthetic. Inevitably, a bit of bleeding. Mr. Hardy, open your eyes. There we are. Can you put some oxygen on your face now? Operation's finished, it's all gone well. You're just waking up, chap. After his little outing into the garden with Mum Rachel, Ben's more relaxed, so now she's going to have another go at breastfeeding him. When the babies are on and feeding well, 
The mother needs to look at the whole picture. What does her baby look like? What do his lips look like? And one of the ways I describe it is like a little fish. So the top lips curled out and the bottom lips curled down. And the chin is right against the breast. And when baby's sucking, the mum should see the whole jaw movement. And people talk about wiggly ears. Not all ears are going to wiggle, but as long as the whole jaw is moving and also she will see some slight movement on her breast tissue. If the baby has dimples when he's sucking then mum needs to take the baby off and start again because this is one of the signs that the baby's not actually correctly positioned. The edge of his jaw's moving there and his ear's slightly going up there. Um, I do find that if I stroke his head that he always responds to it and he will sort of go for a bit more then. Um, and also he you can sort of hear it almost going into his stomach. You sort of hear a little satisfaction there in his hands. We've got no dimples in the cheeks and the side of his jaws going up. I think that's such a satisfying noise. Next on Nurses. I hope you weren't expecting a nice hotel accommodation, mate. Can we move over to the other side, please? That's what else coming in. We have it. Be this morning, I was in so much pain that I could have sworn it was definitely a man. But we're just waiting to see. For us to have two or three babies here is unusual. You know, it's nice to see the end result. It's, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. We're stuffed. It's very difficult at times to keep the male and the staff up because it's like a tap that you can't turn off. The work keeps coming in. You can only do all the things that you do for somebody and just hope that they make it. As you can probably tell, I'm having a wonderful day. Click on screen for more videos of extraordinary humans.